I'm Robin Crane, and this is the Growing Your Financial Business, The Woman's Way podcast. Listen, I was a financial advisor for over a decade, and I got so sick of the old archaic strategies that your grandpa used to get clients. What the industry teaches today is still so outdated and just doesn't work anymore. So I had to find a better way for myself, and then I got obsessed with sharing these how-tos with other women like me. The stuff I teach doesn't require giving up your life, your sanity, or your family time. I want women like you to have it easier than I had it, so you can thrive in the industry. I've now helped thousands of women grow their financial businesses to multiple six figures, some even seven figures per year. So on this podcast, you're going to get an inside look at how they did it so you can do it too. Let's dive into the show. You're going to love this next femme guest. Her name is Tandy Irvin, and she is so loving, so sweet, so kind, so smiley that it will just encourage you and excite you to grow your business because how could you not? She has a very successful tax planning business, and she also has a financial financial planning business. And at the time when I met her, she had about 10 million under management. And I was able to help her grow that business and double that business, getting an additional 10 million in assets under management in just 10 months. She's excited. She loves it. She loves the bottom line. You're going to really enjoy this episode and learn how she was able to do that. Going from someone who wasn't really doing any prospecting, wasn't doing marketing, was really just coasting. And then she put attention and intention into this and grew her ideal book of business. So check it out. Enjoy the episode. Okay, you're going to love this lovely, lovely lady here, Tandy. Um, She's so adorable. So if you're watching on YouTube or one of the channels, you'll know. Um, But I just got so excited to see her because I'm like, oh, Tandy, you know, we go back. So um, Tandy actually, I think, joined FEM. Was it in 2020? Yes, it was. Yeah, crazy year to join FEM. So she joined our FEM program in 2020 and definitely like at a different place in her career, different place in her life, having different goals and dreams and not looking to like maybe hit it out of the park and, you know, go grow like crazy. But um, having a CPA business already, having you had about 10 million under management, like a a decent, you know, financial business, pretty newish, but not like super new. And so we want to talk about um, your journey, Tandy, and like really defining what success looks like to you. So tell us a little about just kind of where you were before we started, because I think a lot of the ladies listening will resonate with that. And then we'll go from there. Okay. Um, The start date of 2020 to you might sound odd, but uh, to me, it made perfect sense. Um, I am a card carrying introvert. And with the 2020 with COVID, with the lockdown, all the changes in how we do business, it leveled the playing field. And I I just saw this as such an opportunity that I didn't have to go to networking groups and pretend like I was having fun and, you know, gather a bunch of business cards and give some out and just be so glad it's over and never fruitful visits for me. So this, I mean, the timing is everything. And and this was just like, oh my gosh, if I can do this online over the phone uh, with, without having to show up in person, this is, this is my kind of uh, marketing. So yeah, that's, it's awesome. that's why uh, that's that's a smart say, woman right there. Hard, start doing, yeah. Start during COVID, but it, it was just perfect. Also, I was at a place my business hadn't grown for years. You know, I'd lose some, I'd gain some, just replace it. So that that 10 million, just status quo, paid the bills and that was it. Um, and then I had a couple of other streams of revenue. So it, it was like, okay. But I, I was having the conversation with myself. We either need to grow this business or sell it. But let's just do something because I'm, I'm boring myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, chance, uh, Robin Crane found me on LinkedIn. Uh, and I, it was, as I said, timing is everything. So I jumped right in with both feet and took, I can't remember the name of the courses, but I took everything available to me at that time. Um, and it just really was such a good fit for me. And then eventually, uh, I knew I ultimately wanted to become a femme, uh, which is the ultimate program uh, with, with, in, in Robin's uh, world. And um, 
So, so I did. Um, and my business doubled uh, within, oh gosh, a, a very short time. I, I'm thinking, Robin, it might have been 12 months or less. I, I think I it was remember. 10 because I brag about you all the time, like, and I have videos of it. So I have it documented, you know, 10 million in 10 months uh, because that was really cool because you wanted to do it in, in a year and you did it in less than a year, which was really great. Um, and I, I love that you said, you know, you wanted to be a femme, you got to be a femme because there's so much, it really does come with an identity. And I've been very proud to have femme where it is in a place where it's more about who you are, also the desire for change within yourself, the willingness to be, um, to, to make changes. And, you know, you, you've said before, you know, I'm not a, a young spring chicken, like some, I don't feel like a young spring chicken anymore either, but it's like, you've been in business for a long time. You built a, a successful accounting business, you know, then you went into financial advisory business, you know, and so many people I think would say like, well, you know, I don't, I don't want to grow anymore. I don't want to have to do anything. I definitely don't want to have to step outside my comfort zone. And, you know, you didn't want to like have to go to networking events as well and like do things that were not aligned, but you were willing to stretch. And that that's the difference between, you know, kind of a, someone who's not a femme and just kind of status quo and someone who's willing to take some risk financially and otherwise, and then really stretch outside their comfort zone to get what they want. And I remember when you first got some wins and you were like, this is like net net. Cause we, you would always come back on to every event we have, cause you're so good at celebrating your wins. And it would be like, we have the progression of Tandy, you know, because it's like, oh, now I got another, I got 5 million, I got 6 million. Like there's definitely a video of you having 6 million under management at that stage. And um, you would, be, you're like net net in my pocket every single month is $4,500 or whatever it is. And you're like, I am an accountant. I know the numbers. I know exactly how much is now hitting my pocket because of this. And it's month after month, year after year, pretty much forever. And so I love that you were appreciative of that and you saw that vision. Cause some people are like, oh yeah, we want AUM, but they don't see like, if you just got a million dollars, just a million dollars, that's an extra $10,000 for at least a decade. That's a hundred grand, right? And then you got an extra 10 and, and more and more and more. So yeah, amazing. Uh, let me talk about the, uh, the stretch because uh, the stretch may mean different things to different people. And my stretch was certainly um, contacting strangers even through social media. That was a stretch. My big win and a, a bit of a stretch was mining my existing clients. So FEM uh, equipped me not just new business, but to mine the business I had. And, and I, I want to be clear on that, that it affects many different ways uh, of, of stretching, but it gave me the confidence. It gave me the, the verbal skills, the, the script, uh, if you will, in, in my head to um, ask and ask and ask and deep, uh, dig deeper. And, and, and that was the, the real win is that I did indeed show up differently um, to people, existing or prospects. Yeah. And sometimes it's like you, you, you come for one reason, but sometimes you get something else and ultimately you get the result that you want. And when you're talking about defining success, it's like really getting clear on what is it that you want. And you were very clear that you wanted recurring revenue. You wanted more AUM. And so, you know, what I find, and, and I know this was the case with you, the strategy of using online marketing and LinkedIn, yes, that doesn't does turn into clients, but just like you said, is that you started showing up differently. And how you do anything, as T. Harv Eker says, how you do anything is how you do everything. And I think for sure, like in the financial industry, the especially women are very anti-sales. Like I don't want to be salesy. I, I was the same way when I first started. Like I don't want to be salesy. I don't want to be greedy. I don't want to like be manipulative. Like, I didn't want to push people. I didn't want to sell people. I just wanted them to want to work with me and to become clients. But guess what? There's a sale there <laughs> that has to happen. Either they're selling you on their excuses or you're selling them on working with you. And when I realized that when I first started, you know, back in you know 2007, that's my main, my real first year, I had to learn these skills of sales because I was like really against it. And I think a lot of women who come to me, like they don't, they definitely don't even want to admit they want to be good at sales because it sounds like 
that's going to be more manipulative when it's the exact opposite. I was talking about this in another podcast, but, and I think that's huge because you learned how to have these conversations and what you say script, but it's almost more like a framework, like understanding what do they really want, understanding what's really holding them back and having that confidence just to know that if you know this information about them, then that's the real way that you can provide more value. And I think you took that on really well without being concerned about, oh no, it's going to be salesy. Um, but instead learning it like, okay, now I know how to communicate and talk to people and, and have better conversations. So how did, how else did you see that showing up or how did that affect even your confidence and mindset? Well, and, and, um, the, the stigma about sales, um, uh, which is so unwarranted, we're all in sales. But you also gave us the, the tools to reframe it if you need to. How can I help you? What value can I bring? What skills do I have that you don't? That's selling. But if you don't like the word sales, uh, simply reframe it. And when you really get this prospect, this client, this, whomever needs your knowledge, and, and it feels good when people uh, at the end of the phone call go, gosh, Tandy, I didn't know that. I've learned so much. I was selling, sure. And they needed that that information. So and appreciate, with yeah, and sale, appreciating it. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry yeah. to interrupt there. So, no, that, that's okay. that, that really... Um, that was a, uh, a game changer in a lot of ways is when you can shift that perspective from helping um, mm -hmm. uh, and, and away from I'm selling. But it boils down to asking for the order. And you can mm -hmm. call that what it want, you know, however you want it, but you, you've got to ask for the order. Right, right. Yeah, and I, I think the shift too is like the difference between I do think most financial advisors are order takers. Like they come, and you've heard me talk about this before, but they, they come, you know, they have someone come in and who typically already has an interest in getting some help. And so they pile on this, like here are my accounts or here's what I want you to manage or here's, you know, what I think I need help with. And they drive the bus and then they tell you like, what can you do with that? And now we're kind of on the defensive, like, okay, well I can put it in this, I can put it in that. But now you're like competing with everyone else on the planet because it's actually not the investment strategy that's gonna win me over as a client. It's not really like how you're gonna invest the money, although that's important, but it's so interesting because I see this every day, like people talk to me if they're trying to sell me and like they don't ask me anything. And it's like knowing, now that you know how to sell in a way that's really, really best for the client, let's just say, it's really interesting to me when people don't do that and they're just like talk at you, you know? But if you, instead of becoming, being an order taker, instead you lead the conversation and go deeper, then then they're sold because they're like, wow, you're not just selling me what I call selling the box. Like, oh, okay, get this mutual fund or get this money management AUM or whatever for 1%. Like everyone's pretty much doing that within the realm of one to one and a half percent, like with basically the same investment options with very similar strategies. But instead you understand what's important to me and what's driving me and what's scary to me and what's you keeping me up at night, then I'm like, okay, well, I don't really care how you do it. Just get me the result. Right. So how yeah. did that shift things for you? Um, and even relationships with your clients? Well, and, and you, you're making me think of a, a, a few other things. Um, we, we are order takers because that's how we've been taught. Right. It, it is that mindset. And for women, that just flat out doesn't work. We are different. We do care. So we're, we're, our natural inclination is to ask questions and to understand their situation. Chances are we can relate to it somehow. Mm -hmm. So that, that is the other thing that really helped being in a, um, with FEMS, uh, because we truly understood one another, and you certainly um, understood what it was like to be uh, a female in our industry, that it is it is different and very attractive and such an easy way to distinguish ourselves because there's one of me on most corners 
as you go up and down the street um, that my office is on. So um, without forcing it, it's easy to distinguish ourselves. And yes, it does. It flows over into so many other uh, parts. My, my uh, accounting practice, my volunteer um, groups that I'm with, it just, um, yeah, who, who you are in this is who you are every place. And it's, it's given me, it's, it's such overused, but it truly has boosted my confidence. And I, I keep saying it as I show up differently, but that's yeah. exactly what I'm saying. My confidence level is, it's just different. It's just different. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. And it's funny because you say there's one of you on every corner. There was one of you on every corner. There's a financial advisor or, a, or an accountant CPA on every corner, but there's not one of you on every corner. And that's, that's true. I think also is, this is how you build a brand. And I think so often this is missed in the financial industry around the brand. And I, I'm not talking about as much as we do sometimes do this with the advisors I work with. It's like, you know, about making videos and things like that. Although you did make a freaking amazing <laughs> few videos for for sure. Um, oh, so oh, her videos are so good. It's so awesome. Um, but it's not just that. It's just that when you know how to ask the right questions and you're 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 in a position where you're driving the conversation, you're in a position of authority, not because of um, ego or because of any reason where you have to control anyone. It's just controlling the conversation because you are the expert in this situation. And if instead you're, you're what I call selling the box or you're order taking and now like like they're controlling the situation, controlling you, like they won't get what they want because they're, they don't know how, otherwise they'd be doing it on their own successfully. And so what I think happens a lot too is just having the systems is what allows you to shine as you and having your voice. And I do feel like in the industry, you know, this is really important to me for women in the industry to have a voice because, um, you know, Brenda, who you know, I interviewed the other day and she said she was the one woman out of 23 advisors and there were 22 men and one of her and every time she tried to speak up, they would, you know, just shush her and, and, and shun her and <laughs> whatever, shame her and all the shush shush words. And, and it was like, she didn't feel like she did have a voice. And then she had to, you know, and this has happened before. I've had women in my program who they're like, well, I can't do that because of compliance. I can't do that because of this. I can't do that. You know, there's a lot of, I can't. And I'm like, do you, do you have legs? You can, you can walk, right? <laughs> and you know, you can leave, like you're not tied to that. And, um, you know, you're in a, a good position where you're LPL and there's a lot more flexibility, but some people, I think they're, it's more back to the very archaic, and even still, I'm, all the independent firms are still like, obviously the male dominated aspect of it, no matter where you go, just because of the numbers, but at least you had some more independence and you had some more flexibility. But I do think we have to fight a little bit for that voice. And that has to, to, to so you get what you want and you do business the way you want as a woman and as a person that in your, your personality with that. Right. So, um, yeah. Yeah. What, what, uh, I, totally changing here but it, while it crosses my mind it has to come Please. out of my mouth or it fall it you know, goes Great. away so i read your book from cover to cover before we engaged in anything and very detailed very step by step i mean it, it is just a uh, a awesome. manual I, I i hope you are still very very proud of that book thank you so here's the deal though <laughs> when i got among other women, oh my gosh, my knowledge, my, there again, confidence, skill set, soared. So I, I still use the book, as a matter of fact, a, a, as a reference, and it's wonderful. But I tell you, it was being in that community where, like the woman you just mentioned, one out of 23, there, you just don't get that in the real world. I don't get it at LPL. I, I've never heard any of the films say, oh, yeah, you know, it, it's all, uh, I don't know what you're talking about. Um, you know, we, we women rule and, you know, so, which of course we do. But um, of course. The, it, it was, that was such a bonus I had not counted on, again, the introvert doesn't like to share, and I don't really like to hear your story either. But <laughs> when I got among women that, wow, they, um, 
it, it, it was just, it was so different. It was something in my industry I hadn't experienced before, and I didn't realize the value until I was in it. Yeah, well, thank you for saying that. I'm very proud of of this community that we've created, and um, it is it is very special. It, it's definitely, oh, here go my dogs. There they go. Uh, real life, hashtag real life. Um, so just, I think you don't realize how much you need it until you experience it, right? Because, you know, and this happens, They and, and not to knock the conferences, the women's conferences, but it's still not the same. Like you, within a male dominated industry, and even the, they do the one day out of the three, you know, sometimes where it's a women's conference or women's luncheon or whatever, but it's it's like, there's no real vulnerability there. I think what allowed the community, the, the reason the community has been so successful with, making even if a woman just comes into it like making them feel really at home and, and feeling like have instant lifelong friends and i know you still talk to a lot of the femmes every you know i know you and rochelle talk every week you know it's like and someone else was on the podcast saying like they're still like she started back in 2000 uh, 16 well she came to pyp 2015 denise was saying and she still talks to the femmes you know so it's like such an amazing group of women and i do think that a lot of it has to do with you know one is that i've given the ladies permission to be vulnerable by being vulnerable myself but because we have that vulnerability aspect it's like this instant bonding and when you go to conferences financial conferences even with women I don't think they necessarily, and I obviously haven't been to all of them, and you're welcome to correct me if I'm wrong, but necessarily create that space where there's a lot of sharing and vulnerability. Like, it's like, yes, people, they want to share and all that stuff, but it's well, different, yeah, right? It Did you experience that? Vulnerability. Yeah, I'm, I'm calling it safe. Mm. I, I always, always felt safe in film. I go to a conference, no. I don't know you people, and and so you you don't. I never felt as safe to share and be vulnerable. That's great, and even the conferences like with women, like it's just different, right? Is it because? I, I, yes, that's what I meant. Women's conference. Yeah, is it? Do you think it's because? Like, why do you think that? Is, is it just because they're we're okay. under the umbrella? Because you know, we almost have to prove ourselves. Like I know when I was in the industry, it's like I go and it's like I want to look good. I want to, you know, I want to play the part, you know, that sort of thing. I don't want to look like I don't know what I'm doing, but um, do you think it's because it's still under the umbrella of, you know, this male dominated industry? Or do you think it's just because we women in this type of setting tend to be a little bit more like we're, we're more protective of ourselves. We're, we're afraid to share. I, I don't know. I'm just curious as to what you think. No, you, you, you were describing it very well. Okay. We are competitive or mm. we wouldn't be in this industry. We have True. to be competitive. At conferences where you're going to see somebody for an hour and then that's it, we, we lead with our competitive edge. Whereas right. at FEM, because we see these women sometimes multiple times a week, that goes away. There's an yeah. appreciation, a total appreciation of of their successes, of how they do dif uh, business differently, way different. Um, what you know, my company might consider, you know, not even the right way, and and they're doing it very successfully and happily. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, it's it's a way different ball game um, when you're with women at, at a conference rather than women in uh, that are other fems. Yeah, I had someone who's um, coming to the FEM event in October, and, and I saw an email come through that went to my team, but it was like, tell me about this FEM conference. And I was thinking, oh, God, don't say the word conference. Like, it's not a conference. It's it's an event. It's an experience. Like, it's it's not a conference, you know? And she's like, I don't know if I should, you know, be there for the third day because the third day is the fun day. And she's like, because I feel like I need to go home to my kids. Like, I immediately got on WhatsApp and I left her a message. I'm like, you crazy girl. Like, don't be in scarcity around not having enough time with your kids and not having you know or because another night at a hotel like the most amazing experiences happen on the day where you're just bonding and you're just having fun and we actually just added uh something for we're doing our last fem um and and if anyone's wondering why we're doing that is because as a business and as like a mission driven business where we want to impact more women we actually believe that we have to go 
to a, a much higher volume of people within the industry that's unfortunately not just women to get through to more women. And that's like one of our shifts in our model that we're gonna, you know, kind of go to the companies and go to, and, you know, not just women so that we can have men recruiting more women and men having a place for women to succeed when they come into the industry and not just having the transactional fact finding things. So we feel like we actually have to make a bigger shift with the industry as a whole, not just with women so that we can ultimately help more women. So um, that's what we came to with our with our um, just our business model for as far as like just creating a more likely scenario to help more women within the industry. But anyway, so we're having our last fem and we created we're going to have a retreat. And so like within this, we're going to have a regular two events. And in the middle of it, we're going to have a retreat because I just did uh, I'm in a women's mastermind called the Unicorn Club, which is just incredible. And we just had this event in San Diego. And the last day we were mostly just hanging out by the pool and the jacuzzi like we actually did these vision boards i have my vision board right here now that's like we're cutting things out like these are seven eight nine and plus figure you know women <laughs> earners they're like really really successful and we're like cutting out little cutouts from the magazines because it's just abundance. It's like in talking to each other about AI or talking to each other about business model, or, you know, at the pool. And it was just, I'm like, wow, that was actually my favorite and most effective day of the three days was not around content. It was about community. It was around community. It was around connecting. It was around, you know, having these little conversations on the side with people who care so much and want you to win and are so supportive. And um, yeah, so we're just going to have a fun retreat, you know, and just more hanging out. So I'm really excited about that. So tell me, let's go back to just kind of like define your own uh, success and what success looks like. So for you and like what has changed? I guess you, you know, you started FEM 2020. Here we are 2023. Like what is compounded for you because of what you learned and what you went through? And then what's kind of like next for you as far as, you know, your vision of your business and what's to come? Um, s s several things, and it's not just the things that I, the, the addition, but it's also what I don't have. I don't have fear. I don't have worry about scarcity. I don't freak when um, th the market goes down. I, I am fine, and I will grow regardless uh, if a client... So, uh, you know, my, my brother-in-law just got his license. I'm going to go with him. Whatever. You know, good luck to you. Uh, it, it's um, that has been huge for me. Um, I, I'm a worry. Uh, and I even tell my clients, you know, you pay me to worry for you. I do it very well. My mother taught me how and I'm, I'm really good at it. Um, so that's huge, Robin. I, I think bigger I than that. anything I else that. is that. I'm just fine. <laughs> That's, that is really huge. And, you know, sometimes we're looking at our vision and we're thinking, what do I want? And we just did this actually, we had a femme virtual event just a few weeks ago. And we, we said, well, what would you really love? I learned this from my friend, Jennifer Hootie about vivid vision. Um, but then we also focused on well, what don't you want? And the don't wants are, like you said, as important as the do wants to figure out what you can ultimately create and, and have. But that's that's so so amazing for me to hear. I also have a very worrisome mother. I know what that's like. And gosh, I look at her and go like, oh, I'm so sad that you have to worry so much. You know, I wish I could take that off your shoulder, which I think we all kind of do to some degree with our mothers and parents to like think that. Oh, if I worry, somehow she's going to worry less or something. But um, but to t to have that, and I think a lot of that comes with when you can see what happens with these shifts. Like you know, you you went through. I remember because we have one of the strategies we have is the interview strategy, and you were diligent. Like you did your eighty some odd interviews. Or supposed to, I said do a hundred. You know, you did eighty some odd interviews, and you hadn't gotten a client from an interview. And you would think we'd be like, oh no, like this is horrible, it didn't work. But I remember even during that time, every time I'd bring you onto an event, you'd be like, yeah, well, I'm doing that and that, and then I'm showing up differently with my clients and now I have 4 million and then I'm doing that. I haven't gotten a client yet, but one person from that interview told me about this and now I'm using with my clients and I got another 2 million. And then I didn't do that, but I'm, now I know what to say. I know how to show up and and that confidence like you talked about is like, like wow, if, if everybody wants money, 
from the program. Like everybody wants to be like, okay, I invested this money and I want to double, triple, quadruple. I think it's actually almost everybody in FEM ends up getting a 10 time return at a minimum because even if they just get, yeah. you know, some, like you got a much, much bigger return from that because that's didn't cost you a hundred thousand dollars to be in the program. And you're going to make that every single year just from the first 10 million. And I know you've gotten more, right? So the, right. the ROI is really easy as far as the money, but I think what, what, no one really knows going into it. It's almost like we don't really know what we need until after we get it is to get rid of all those things you just said, like to not have that feeling of pressure. Oh, I got to make money. I got to get my next client. Where's my next guy going to come from? Having that pressure of like, well, how can you not go to a networking event, but still get clients? And ultimately you were able to get clients from LinkedIn marketing. And ultimately you were able to get clients from interview strategy. And ultimately like all the things worked. It just not always on our timeline, right? But I, I love that because I'm. That's where I go back to this identity of femme. It's like, and again, I'm. I, I'll never let go of that identity for everyone, and for no matter where the program goes, and who knows. But um, that that's so important because it's. I always. I always promise this, and I think it's a, a big promise, and it's not easy to create overnight, even in a year. But ideal business, ideal life, right? Because so I want you to help you build your ideal business so you can have your ideal life. And I was mentioning this to the femmes the other day that like, none of us really have it, even myself. Like, is it totally ideal? No, but I know I keep striving for that. Like it's sure compared to a year ago, it's more ideal compared to 10 years ago. It's way more ideal, right? It's like compounding effect, you know, but it's who I become and that like stepping into the, the femme that I am of like being able, female empowered money maker, like I can always make money. And to have that off your shoulders of like the stress that we usually have is I think really, really huge. So thank you for sharing that. And yeah, what else do you have to add on that component or anything else for what's next for you? Um, it just seems to be with so little effort growing organically and, and it keeps growing year after year. And I can't even Robin pinpoint and say it was this skill that I learned that, you know, that made this happen. But I, I keep coming back to I'm showing up differently. My expectations are different because I, I'm a big believer in we get what we expect. Um, mm -hmm. and, and I do expect to grow. I expect to continue my success. And it has certainly happened. That's awesome. And it's great too, because you can have the lifestyle and uh, I was reading, I'll just end with this, but I was reading this book um, by Keith Cunningham. It's called um, The Road Less Stupid. It's a really good book if if y'all want to read something really good, but uh, Keith Cunningham is brilliant, but um, it's called The Road Less Stupid. And one of the things uh, he talked about was how, you know, people are always gearing up to sell their business. I can't wait to, like, I want a sellable, scalable business. I want to sell it. And then you're like, you know, depending on the business, you might get a three times multiple or something like that. So if you're, you know, let's just say making a million dollars a year and then you sell, let's just say in the industry, it's it's not necessarily three times, but let's say you get good enough that you have systems and team and all the things, because it does depend on all those things, but you get three times, it's never really revenue, it's gonna be EBITDA, right? But like, let's just say it's three times. So now you get $3 million. Well, if you were making a million dollars a year, granted there's expenses or whatnot, but like, that's not gonna last you all that long. But this yep. is why a lot of financial advisors who do build their ideal businesses, like are able, like they hold on for so long because if you can get it to a point where it's very sustainable, it's not stressing you out. It's not, you know, it's it's kind of like more like I talked about the merry ground. You get it going, get it going, and then you give it a little push. And you love meeting with clients anyway, and you give it a little push. And you know, you set the boundary so no one's freaking out when the market goes down and you give it a little push. And you get to, you know, have that like, who wants to sell the business? You know, you can do better not. And I'm not saying you never want to, but I do think that you said at the beginning, I'm either going to sell this thing or I'm going to grow it. And it's really cool to see that you decided to grow it. You successfully did. And it sure doesn't sound like you're on your way out. <laughs> no. And, and I've had the exact same conversation you just described because people look at this white hair and they're like, oh, how much longer are you going to do this forever? I mean, I, 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 it's, it's just, uh, yeah. And I look at the two times, the three times, the whatever they promise you. So what? I'm happy, yeah. <laughs> and it's working yeah. now. Exactly. So that's awesome. Yeah. 
Well, thank you yeah. so much. This is super fun. I love, I love, um, not, I mean, I knew obviously, cause I don't know, it's been a year or so, something like that. I know we talked a couple of times, but like, it's, it's good to also tell the world about it and see you in this lovely light and see that you continue to grow and expand and where you are today. And, and we'll, Hey, maybe another year from now we'll do another time capsule and another year from then we'll do it and, and see where oh, you're I, at. Cause it's, it's the compounding that. is crazy, right? Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much for including me on this. This was a lot of fun. Thank you. Oh, I always will. I always will. You know, I'd have you at every event still if I could. <laughs> you're, you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you all for listening as well. We'll see you next time.